<laughs> but, uh, so anyway, I thought I'd uh, show you here. I found these, uh, came across these recently in our place. And, uh, these here trousers, they're, they're the... Uh, not, I had those in 1981 when we started the, the band and uh, wore them all the way through to uh, Top of the Pops 1983 when we played 68 Guns. They've still got this, the uh, salt on the sweat from Geeks of 1983. <laughs> I don't know what that bit is there. <laughs> I didn't put it there. And uh, as you can see, they were well, well worn and uh, patched up many times to make it across uh, all the tours that we did, but it's, uh, so I might even wear them tonight because I could probably still get in them now. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, the jacket from, uh, that was uh, highlighted in the Deceiver video, and I bought that in, um, in a military surplus store in, in Chester, in about 1982. Uh, in fact, uh, thinking about it, no, I bought it before, I had it in 81, and uh, it's got uh, medals on it, and uh, it was a bit of a, inspired by the sort of uh, 60s psychedelia period of when we were writing things like Figured Steps, and uh, we saw lots of pictures of uh, Pete Townsend wearing medals, and the pop art explosion in the 60s, and uh, the back of the jacket, in this jacket, the front itself, featured on the uh, 1983-84 EP part of the Counter Attack collection and uh, when I, uh, before we, we made it as a band, I used to wear this going out in Rill. <laughs> and uh, my dad used to take me into town and I had this on and some black trousers with a red stripe down them that Ed would on more later in life. And uh, I used to have a bugle strapped to my waist as well. <laughs> Honestly, the cowboy boots with spurs on. And my dad used to drop me off in real, he goes, I'm not dropping you off in the high street, that's like that. He goes, I'll drop you on the other side of Bell Road Bridge in the car park in the dark. And you can walk in, but I'm not being seen with you looking like that with my mates in town. And uh, once I went to the golf club with, me, with my dad, I'm dressed like this. And um, in, in Ridland Golf Club, and, and my uncle Tony was there, my dad's brother, and he said to me, he goes, uh, all the members of the golf club don't like the way you look, Mike. And I said, well, all the alarm fans don't like the way you look, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, this, this jacket here is uh, another one. Uh, this was worn in the, the Where Were You Hiding When The Storm Broke uh, video. And it's a little one, so we're inspired by the, uh, the pop art era of the band. And uh, it's, again, it's got medals and badges sewn on it that I collected. A few uh, badges have gone. There's um, a few CND badges on there originally. Uh, so we're the people your parents warned you about. And there's a Beatles one and a Bob Dylan one. And a very old alarm IRS badge from, from 83, I think. And uh, on the back is, uh, is a, a cut of the, uh, the very first ever Poppy t-shirt that was produced in 1982. And uh, Carl Parsons and I, um, when we were putting the, the White Cross Poppy t-shirt together for this event, celebrate 30 years of the Poppy. This was uh, one of the originals we went back to. We kind of remastered the Poppy, went back to all the original artwork. And uh, this is really the inspiration because it was the first print of the poppy that was ever produced. And then, uh, that's not this one good, but this, this is a, a nice uh, red shirt <laughs> that I wore uh, pretty much on most of the gigs on the, uh, the 1986 uh, Strength Tour, 85-86. And uh, this is the shirt I wore at uh, the UCLA, and obviously, I was sort of going through a Spandau Ballet phase at the time. <laughs> and, uh, quite a nice shirt. Still stands the test. And it's all kind of ripped. If you pull it apart, it kind of splits and you can see all the colours behind it. And uh, this is when I was going through a Bon Jovi phase. <laughs> oh, we were playing at stadiums at the time. Uh, and uh, we were playing at Wembley Arena with Queen. And uh, this is the jacket I wore on the stage, and I think it was the only time I ever wore the jacket was that uh, one gig with quite long fringes. And uh, uh, 
the fringe jacket, the western look that, that we adopted in Iran came because of our friend um, Red Eye, he was our roadie at the time. Uh, Red now uh, resides up in, uh, in California and works with Bob Dylan. Uh, and he's the best man at my wedding, he's still, still my best mate. And um, Red went to the Future Armour Festival in Deeside in, uh, in 81. And, and really the look of the band then was more of a sort of militaristic sort of look. And uh, we were still finding our feet as a band. And uh, Red went to the Future Armour Festival and he, and he saw um, Pete Burns and Dead or Alive. And they were all wearing sort of cowboy gear on stage and came home and said, oh, we've got to get some western wear that look great on the band. And uh, so, to be honest, um, the look of the band, the playing for it lies at the feet of uh, Pete Burns' is <laughs> uh, But uh, yeah, this is the jacket that, that we wore at Wembley and it was, uh, it was a great occasion playing at Wembley. Uh, as you can imagine, um, the home of football and all that. But, so for me, uh, to go to the gig, um, we, uh, I don't know if I told the story but before, but uh, the, the night before I went to bed nice and early, got playing at Wembley, want to get up early, get to the, to the stadium, have a game of football on the pitch before the gig started and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we all got picked up in the van uh, to go to the gig. And then we, the last person to be picked up on the way, en route to Wembley was, was Nigel Twist. And when we got to his place at about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, we rang the bell and his wife came down and said, uh, oh, he's not ready yet, he's only just come in five minutes ago. <laughs> and he'd been out with Michael Hutchins the night before. <laughs> and uh, obviously Michael Hutchins and In Excess were playing on the bill as well. And uh, I think they'd been doing all sorts of nefarious substances the night before <laughs> and staying up rather late. And uh, so... Uh, uh, everyone, the tour manager, decided to throw Nigel in a cold shower and wake him up. But uh, Mark Taylor and I thought, we can't sit in the van, we're, off, we're going to play Wembley. So we jumped out of the van and got on the tube and went to uh, the Wembley Way station. And we walked down Wembley Way and it was fantastic with all the status quo fans and the Queen fans and the Alarm fans all with poppy flags, all wishing us luck on the way into the gig. And it was a, it was a great way to experienced the, the, the event first hand and we walked down the Wembley Way as I said, got to see the Twin Towers and we walked in, got a football, went straight down the other end and smashed one in the back of the net. <laughs> <laughs> and the gig was pretty good too. <laughs> so, uh, and then this, this jacket is another in the, in the line of, uh, of uh, fringe jackets that I like to sport from time to time. And uh, this is uh, one that I wore on, on the Raw album period and also wore this jacket, it's the, the last jacket that I wore with the original lineup in the alarm back in 91 at the Brixton Academy, so quite a lot of history in that jacket as well. And, and then here we go, we've got, uh, bring us up today, is a combat jacket that I've had for many, many years, and this has seen me through a lot of life, and uh, every time I've gone on an adventure, I've had it stitched with where I've been from, Mount Fuji rocks in 2010 and Kilimanjaro, Peru, Snowden, Everest, they're all there, stitched into the jacket. And that comes out from time to time when I'm on the love of strength duty. And uh, so guitars, this is, uh, you've seen this before, this is uh, my Jetson guitar that I bought in, uh, in Woolworths in Real, when there was such a thing. And um, it was put Sick it up at the time with I Love Noel Edmonds. <laughs> Resistance is futile. And uh, some television, Johnny Jewel. And um, I'm Stranded by the Saints. And uh, even a sticker from the Rattlesnore Vegicus, such Stranglers album, it says includes free single. Very generous of the Stranglers, I know. And that's the guitar that uh, I played in the toilets. Uh, with O'Malley, rest in peace, and uh, we played that guitar was seen when we played with the Buzzcocks and the Clash and, and Eric's in 1977, and uh, it was the beginning of a lot of things, you might even see it in the vinyl film, because uh, when we were recording the soundtrack for the vinyl uh, film, we needed a Sarah Schultman director who was, uh, had actually seen the toilets play and went out with, uh, with Glyn, the bass player, 
And I'll tell you about that coincidence when uh, we were watching, before we watched the film. And uh, she said, I need some punk classics in the film. And so I said, well, they were going to have things like The Clash in there and all that sort of stuff. And I said, why don't I re-record the, the toilet songs that have never been heard before properly? And so we used this guitar to, to make the vinyl soundtrack, or some of it anyway. And um, where's James? There he is. James, my friend here. He, I said, oh, when I used to play this in 1977, I used to have a little distortion box so I used to plug into the guitar. And, and it was not the floor, it used to literally plug in the guitar and the lead would come out of it to the amp. And uh, James me, James said, oh, I've got four of those. <laughs> and of course, but when they got there, all four of them did the work. <laughs> but by the time we took them apart, we got one to work. And, uh, and it was the instant sound of 1977. And uh, when you get to see the film vinyl, you, you will see and hear the sound of this guitar in all its glory. But uh, from electric guitars, moved onto acoustics with the alarm. And uh, this is one of the first alarm guitars uh, that was based on this one, which is a, a replica of the very first ever alarm guitar. This is my. And the original one is, is with uh, my friend Rob Bevis, who was our Rob Bevis is, uh, was our first ever proper fan, and he was a huge Seventeen fan. And Rob was from um, North Holt in London, and he came to see us play at a gig in the Music Machine in 1979, and followed us through our mod period playing with the Secret Affair, and the Purple Hearts, and the, and the Circles. And um, Rob was actually. Um, heartbroken when we changed the name to the alarm and went and changed our style because he, he was a big mod fan and uh, but he, he, he got to like the alarm when he saw it live in the end and uh, Rob has the original of this guitar which is an Angelica and um, he keeps it safe and he's coming later on tonight and um, and this was a copy I made for, for last year's gathering and recreated all the, the stickers that are on there, and the stickers on this guitar, uh, that one there, it says Polygram Studio, the grey one, is uh, when we did some alarm demos in 1982, and the green one there, PCL SU, backstage pass, that was uh, from the Polytechnic of Central London, and that was uh, when we played a gig with the Jam, the uh, Right to Work march through London, and we supported the Jam in there with acoustic guitars, and uh, the only difference in the look of this guitar from the original is that I realised that I put that green stick on the wrong way round to the original. For those who like factoids. <laughs> and the rest are mainly uh, some uh, CND stickers from the, from the period. Uh, and uh, also that one there, the yellow one, with the writing, the green writing. Never again will I stand on the pinion step drill. That was written by Eddie McDonald himself in the day. And uh, that, that guitar there was the one that, uh, when it looked all clean and nice, Dave Sharp came to my mum's house and asked my mum if I could, he could borrow the guitar. And he's the one that took it away and put all the pickups in it and uh, mutated it into the uh, electric instrument. And we, we did that because we felt that we were in translating our songs from guitar to the band and playing them on electric guitars. Something was being missing, we were missing something. And so the, the idea of amplifying the acoustic, that we could still stay true to the spirit of the songs we were playing. And by playing an acoustic rather than electric, it changed the way we thought about the, the way we played guitars.